of reversible bullets. You can also keep in mind that this N88 will go and fuel the respiratory chain of the liver cell that we're talking about, right? NADH fuels it to NADH to open an oscillatory reductase, which is complex one of the mitochondria that pumps four protons from the matrix into the inner membrane space, thus powering ATP synthase with a proton gradient. Okay? So we're getting lots of energy doing this. And of course, when a fuel plane goes and takes the ketone body, the ketone body will be dumped into the blood and goes to peripheral tissues. Okay, enough on that. Now, this one over here is you generate glycine. So this one right here, this is glycine. This is glycine, right? Now, effectively, what you can say for this next reaction of steering hydroxy double transfer is on some level, it's going to take two glycines. Now, that's not entirely true, and for more elucidation on this, go to the tetrahydrofolate video. Um, but for instance, we're going to need for steering hydroxy double transfer in the catabolic direction, we're going to need something called N5 N10 methylene tetrahydrofolate. And that's this molecule that's shown right here. N5 N10 methylene tetrahydrofolate. We need that to make steering. Okay. Now, one of the ways that you get in by this mentally separate hydrophobic is by using this enzyme system right here called the glycine cleavage enzyme, also referred to right here as a glycine cleavage system. Okay? That's one way we can get in by this mentally separate hydrophobic. Now, there are other ways to get in by this mentally separate hydrophobic, so this isn't the only way. It's not the only In other words, we don't just have to use glycine to get it, we get it through other methods using the tetra hydrophobic glycine But on some level, we can use two molecules of glycine to get serum. So I just want to make that perfectly clear. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to look at a pseudo mechanism for the glycine cleavage system so we can get a kind of understanding of what's happening in this mechanism. Okay? So again, we're not looking at arrow pushing or anything like that. We're just trying to get a broad understanding. Now, what we have to understand about the glycine cleavage system is it's divided into four parts. There are four loosely attached uh, proteins that interact with each other. You can sort of do it in the center, there's the H subunit. And if you notice on the H subunit, you have this guy right here, this is lipoate, right? So there's a lipoate that's bound to a lysine residue in the H subunit. And the H subunit, through its lipoate, is able to interact with both the P, the T, and the L subunits. And each one of those other subunits has a separate function. For instance, the P subunit is designed to form a shift-based linkage um, between glycine and the pyridoxal phosphate. And then that performs the decarboxylation. Okay? And in the process of doing that, it binds um, the remains of glycine, in other words, the carbon skeleton of glycine, it binds that to the lipoid. Okay? The T subunit transfers that carbon skeleton onto tetrahydrofolate, and that makes it bind into the methylene tetrahydrofolate. Now, in the process of doing this T subunit reaction, you generate slowly reduced lipoid. So the L subunit is going to perform the redox reaction necessary to regenerate the resting state of the H subunit. So I hope this picture makes a little bit of sense. T subunit does the decarboxylation, T subunit synthesizes the bind into the methylene tetrahydrofolate. And L subunit regenerates the rest of the enzyme. And this is not like a, you know, these are not like an attached quaternary structure type of proteins. These are actually fairly loosely associated proteins. Okay, that's why it's not called the glycine, it doesn't have like a defined uh, name, like pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. It's simply just called the glycine cleavage system. All it is is a bunch of loosely associated proteins that just happen to be um, chemically active together. Okay, so let's look at the mechanism. So notice that we have a point in the right here. Notice that we have a pyridoxal phosphate attached to the P subunit. And of course, in that rest, the pyridoxal phosphate has an aldehyde attached to it. That's the name Pyridoxal phosphate, right? And the first step of the mechanism is to make a shift based attachment between pyridoxal phosphate and glycine. And we know that shift based linkage right here. Specifically, it's a coordinated shift based linkage. And essentially, what's going to happen in the step between B and C is you're going to have a shift based hydrolysis around the same time in the mechanism that you have the decarboxylation. So, this carbon dioxide or this carboxyl group B is as carbon dioxide. And as you hydrolyze the shift base, it ligates to the lipoate. And we know that ligation right here. So, the lipoate breaks an oxidized bond, that was the disulfide with, and it passes to the glycine skeleton. Okay. Now, at this point, in, in the step between C and D, this is the point in which N5 is and methylene tetrahydrofolate is made. Right? This is the point. And in the process, you lose ammonia. Okay, so we built the ammonia loss right here. And this guy right here, oops, go back. Where was it? I'm not sure what happened. Hold on. Okay, yeah. This guy right here, this is our N5 N10 methylene tetrahydrofolate. Okay? And that's what you can be used for both serine biosynthesis, or we could say glycine catalysis. Okay? Because so in this reaction, we're ultimately going to form serine. Okay? And then what happens is we have the totally reduced form of the lipoate, right? And that's not useful because the mechanism requires it to start in the fully oxidized form. So this cold enzyme right here, which is FAD, this is going to perform the oxidation to get the lipoate back in back into its oxidized form. In the process, we generate FADH2. Note that right here. Okay. But NAD, like most um, platins, is covalently, or at least it's severely strongly interacting with the protein. So what you have to do is you have to re-oxidize -re FADH2 back to FAD. And this is accomplished by NAD oxidation. So NAD performs the oxidation and is reduced to NADH. You can note that right here. So what are our end products from this reaction? Well, we get carbon dioxide, which is noted here. We get ammonia, right? That's generated in steps between P or C and D, right? We also get N5, N10, methylene, tetrahydrofolate, and an NADH. Okay, so those are our products. Okay, and of course we know the NADH right here. Okay. And now we have N5, N10, methylene, tetrahydrofolate. That's going to react with another molecule of glycine in serine hydroxy level transpiration. Okay. And this particular reaction is going to make serine. And this is going to make serine. And serine hydroxy level transpiration is another. 
And if we can irreversibly dioxygenate the sulfur atom right here on the city. So both atoms of molecular oxygen are going to get incorporated into the cysteine molecule on the sulfur atom. What that generates is this molecule right here, which is called sulfenoalanine. And the reason it's called sulfenoalanine is because it has a sulfeno group. And if you were to look at the rest of the molecule, well, hey, that's an alanine, right? Or well, you could call it an alanyl group, right? So that's the name sulfenoalanine. Now, sulfenoalanine really stands at the crossroad in liver cell metabolism. Um, the sulfenoalanine can go one of two directions. Either it can go and be degraded to pyruvate through the next enzyme, or it can go into something called taurine biosynthesis. So we don't go into a lot of detail here about taurine, but effectively what it is is it's a molecule that can be ligated to certain bio acids to make them more hydrophilic, and it's used in digesting them faster than water. Okay, so taurine would be used there. So that's one direction it can go, but the direction we're going to, we're going to consider here is the direction of cysteine metabolism. Okay, now what happens if cysteine is pretty large enough? Well, like we said, you don't want a whole lot of it in the blood because it can cause a cysteine toxicity. So the cell reacts by making more of this enzyme, cysteine dioxygenase. But what happens if cysteine levels fall in the blood? Well, those levels are sensed, and what ends up happening is to prevent a uh, dangerously low level of cysteine through catabolism, this enzyme cysteine dioxygenase is ubiquitinated. And when you ubiquitinate a protein, What that means is you're transferring molecules of ubiquitin, which are other proteins, onto the protein itself. And when a protozoan, which is like molecular garbage can, when it recognizes a protein that has ubiquitin on it, it proteolizes that protein. In other words, if you have protein A that has ubiquitin on it, the proteasome will recognize the ubiquitin molecule and it will proteolize protein A. So in order to prevent extremely low levels of cysteine, um, ubiquitin is attached to the biosynthesis and the enzyme would be degraded to prevent further metabolism. This allows cysteine levels to be fairly constant in the blood and to prevent um, unsafe levels either on the high or low end. But anyways, we get sulfenoalanine through this enzyme. Now we're going to run in the direction of cysteine catabolism, and sulfenoalanine will react to sulfenoalanine transaminase. And just like all transaminases, this is a pure oxal phosphate dependent reaction, right? And mechanistically, it's not this way, but uh, from the thickness test point of view, when you're trying to remember structures, you can think of, think of these reactions as substitutions between amines and carbonyl. So this is the alpha amine of cysteine. So in the this alpha amine of sulfenoalanine, excuse me, we should expect to see an alpha keto group in the next molecule when we do. So what we're doing is we're taking the molecule of alpha ketoglutarate and basically taking the amine from sulfenoalanine and placing it on the alpha carbon of uh, alpha ketoglutarate. So that's going to give us no glutamate, right? Yeah, sulfenopyruvate. Now, sulfenopyruvate is going to undergo a spontaneous hydrolysis, meaning that it has a negative delta C and it occurs not in the And so the bond that's going to be cleaved is this one right here. And in the process, we generate sulfite and pyruvate. Now, if you are a liver cell, the pyruvate that you generate is going to go into gluconeogenesis before glucose, and that glucose will be released by the hepatocyte into the blood to feed peripheral tissues. But you also don't want a lot of sulfite. So sulfite will react with an enzyme called sulfite oxidase. And sulfite oxidase catalyzes the incorporation of one atom of oxygen into sulfite to make sulfate. So this molecule right here, this is sulfate. Okay, and as we know uh, from biosynthesis, the sulfate can be incorporated into uh, three prime phosphor adenylate to make PAS. And PAS can be used for sulfate transfers in certain enzymatic reactions. So let's do a quick recap of this reaction scheme. Cysteine reacts with the vaporate and committed step in its catabolism, which is cysteine dioxygenase, which incorporates both atoms of molecular oxygen into the sulfur atom of cysteine, generating sulfonylalanine. Remember that this enzyme is regulated by ubiquitination. In other words, if cysteine levels rise, the enzyme is non ubiquitinated. But if cysteine levels fall, in order to prevent extremely low levels of cysteine in the blood, cysteine dioxygen is ubiquitinated and a proteasome proteolyzes the enzyme. This gives us sulfonylalanine, which is transaminated by sulfonylalanine transaminase to give us sulfonylpyruvate. Now, one thing I did not mention earlier, and I do want to be sure to mention this, is that so, you know how many transaminase is the same enzyme as aspartate transaminase. And what I want to do is this. I want to ask you a question. Look at the structure of sulfonyl halogen. My question to you is, what's an amino acid that looks very similar to that that's one of our primary points? Well, if you look at the structure of this, okay, we still have our alpha carboxyl group, we have our alpha amine, we have our alpha carbon that's right here in my analysis, and we have our beta carbon, and then what if I have this? Right. What if I have this? Well, structurally, this, well, this is aspartate, right? And structurally, aspartate looks very similar to sulfenoalanine. Now, of course, um, this carbon atom right here, of course, this carbon atom is a lot smaller than the sulfur atom, right? But they do look very similar, okay? Um, if you were to look at the rest of the molecule, right, it's just alanine, right? Just like it's alanine here, right? This group right here, this is just an alanyl group. And so that you just have this negative charge that's attached to that alanyl group. In the case of sulfenoalanine, it's a sulfenoal group. In the case of aspartate, it's a carboxyl group. So structurally, they're very similar to each other, and that's why you know, how Transamination is the same enzyme as aspartate transaminase. They're one of the same. In other words, another way of saying this is that sulfenoalanine reacts with aspartate transaminase. Okay? And remember that aspartate transaminase is both a mitochondrial and a cytosolic enzyme. Keep that in mind. Okay? So sulfenoalanine reacts with aspartate transaminase because sulfenopyruvate. Sulfenopyruvate undergoes a spontaneous hydrolysis, and that bond that, or that, that line that's in purple represents right, the bond that's being cleaned. And we get pyruvate and sulfite. Pyruvate goes into gluconeogenesis in the liver to have a site, and the glucose gets dumped into the blood and feeds the peripheral tissues. The sulfite is oxidized by sulfite. 
my oscillator will sulfide, sulfate, sulfate, which is a less toxic version of a sulfur oxygen containing compound. So I hope this is going to give you a little bit of intuition on the heat metabolism. See you in the next video. Welcome back. In the last video, I mentioned that there were ways that we could physically convert L theory to D theory. And it's not that we're the only organisms that can do this. In fact, there are lots of other organisms like bacterial cells. They can actually do this readily. In fact, they, in large part, convert a lot of their L to D Okay. And in general, in humans, when we do this to L theory to D theory, this is going to be a paradoxical phosphate dependent racialization. Okay. And the enzyme that catalyzes this in humans is called serine racialization. And if you remember from the last video, I mentioned that the reason is called racialization. Is that effectively you're racemizing your uh, concentration of serine. You're taking a lot of the L serine and converting some of it into D serine. So you're not going to actually make a really thick mixture, but I think it gets the point across. You're taking some of your L isomers and converting them into D isomers. So what this enzyme is going to do is it's going to take L serine and it's going to, um, it's going to isomerize the alpha carbon. So if you look here, if we look here at the serine, okay, here's the alpha carbon in orange. Okay, and we're basically going to take the L um, serial isomer and convert it into D, and this mechanism is dependent on periodontal phosphate. Okay, this is one reason why you should definitely get your body with D6, right? Because B6 can be converted to periodontal phosphate. So you absolutely need D6 to do this, but that's the side one. Okay, so at best, the periodontal phosphate is going to be um, covalently bound in a ship based linkage to a lysine residue in the active site. So it's a phosphate chart. Um, it's covalently bound to a lysine residue. And there are, of course, um, um, residues in the active site that keep this oxygen with a negative charge, they keep this nitrogen with a purity rate protein and so forth. But effectively what's going to happen is we're first going to create the linkage between the L amino acid, in this case the serine, and uh, the periodontal phosphate. So the alpha amine of the serine is going to start off in the uh, G-protein state. It is going to be a nucleophilic attack on, on this carbon of periodontal phosphate. That's going to effectively kick these high electrons onto the nitrogen that's part of the lysine. And so we should generate this, this um, linkage between serine and periodontal phosphate, but you still have the periodontal phosphate makes a single bond to the lysine residue of the acocyte. So not only is the periodontal phosphate that's the lysine, now you have the amino acid covalently attached. Okay? And at this point, what's going to happen is you're going to have a beta elimination. Okay? So keep in mind, um, keep in mind that there's a lone pair on this nitrogen as part of this, the lysine residue. What's going to attack one of the protons that's on the alpha of the, of the series, and that's going to initiate the beta elimination. Okay? So this is going to be a concerted process of the E2 um, elimination by molecular and so forth. And what that's going to do is create a protein of shift based linkage between the serine amino acid and the periodontal phosphate. Now, what's important to keep in mind is that the serine at this point, or basically what was the serine, of course, now is shit based. But what was the serine has L serial isomers. Okay, so this carbon, again, that I'm putting on you in purple, this carbon right here, this is the L isomer. We haven't changed the, we haven't changed the serial to create that carbon. Everything's still the same, so it's still the L isomer. What I really want to do in this video is, is not to memorize or learn a mechanism blindly, but to really understand this mechanism. Because this, this hopefully should give you a lot of intuition on what's happening, especially with respect to changes in conformation and uh, stereochemistry, how things exist in an active site. Now bear in mind that this up here, what was here, is of course now is the base, right? That, that's the L isomer, right? And so if we were to draw it in the active site, um, with, and well, let me do this, okay? Let's say that I have an axis right here that goes straight up, that's my axis, right? And then let's say I have this axis. This is my x axis, and of course, going back and coming forward, that's of course the y axis, right? Well, let's, let's say, for instance, that the hydrogen, this alpha hydrogen, keep on this is the alpha hydrogen, the alpha hydrogen alpha carbon bond, let's say that represents the z axis, right? So, what we're doing now is we're imagining, we're imagining the, um, the 